Well, today I'm packing all my gear for a trip to Joshua Tree, and I'm gonna to put together this brand new Pelican Air case with tech pack dividers to carry onto the plane with it. Well, hey everybody, Hudson here. Welcome to Approaching the Scene. I want to thank everybody who's been subscribing. There's a lot of new subscribers. I want to thank everybody who's been liking, sharing, subscribing. Uh, it makes a huge difference for me. So this week, I, I was uh, my, my wife is so crafty, and my best and one of my best photo buddies, David Archer, is so cool. They kind of uh, collaborated. Uh, I had been admiring David's Pelican Air case while we were on our trip to Patagonia during the workshop last year. Uh, he told Stacy about it it showed up under the Christmas tree for me. And, and it's got this cool new system with these tech pack dividers. I don't know if you've seen them. I remember running into the people that were, they're starting up this company at Photo Plus a few years back when I was doing some presentations for, for On One, for my friends at On One. And it's a really cool system. I think it's, uh, it's, it's very protective and yet doesn't take a whole lot of room. So I'm gonna set this thing up. You know, I'll, I'll speed up the video a bit, jump around here and there, show you how it's working out. Uh, you know, and, and I know for people that have followed me for a while, I really like having a rolling case to carry my gear onto the plane these days. You know, my back doesn't need to be hauling a big, heavy camera bag full of all my stuff on and off the plane and through airports. So I really like having a roller bag that fits in the overhead. But, you know, my buddy David on uh, our trip to Patagonia had this really nice ultralight Pelican air case. It's got your typical Pelican style handles. It's got a nice business card holder that's locked when it's closed. It's got locking tabs to lock shut. And it's got this nice pull up handle and rolls really smoothly and it fits in the overhead. But you know, if they were to say, hey, overhead's full, we have to gate check. I'd feel a lot better gate checking this hard padded case with my gear in it in that kind of eventuality. So. The way I like to travel is with one rolling case and then with, you know, this is my F-stop Tolopa. If it's a bigger trip, sometimes I take the bigger Suka, but I have the backpack packed into a big duffel checked with my, with my tripod and fluid head. So, and that way I can use this as kind of gear storage. If I'm on a trip where we're working from the car or, you know, from an Airbnb like we'll be in Joshua Tree, I can grab what I want out of this, have this in the car, mix and swap out what I actually need in my backpack and I kind of have a, a storage locker, so to speak. So we'll go through that. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the difference between filming with the D850, which I'm filming this right now, and it's a little frustrating because I'm going to be packing both my Nikon Z6 and Z7, and I've gotten so used to filming with the Zs that it's, it's frustrating and a little bit lower quality, you might notice, filming with the Nikon D850. Um, I think this is one of the last times I'll I'll work with a non-mirrorless uh, doing video work and I'll talk about why. I'm also going to take a question about why back button focus is so important. And I'll also talk a little bit about, about my Cuba workshop. I've had uh, some, some movement there. There's, there's a lot more sales in the second workshop. There's only a few spots left in that. Uh, and one slot has opened up in the first workshop. Actually, one of the participants decided that they want to bring their wife along in the workshop and moved into the second workshop because there's, uh, there's more space there. So. So there's one slide up, and I'll talk about that at the end of the video. All right, so let's jump in and take a look at this whole system. So TechPack sends this little card here, and it basically shows you that you need to measure. the. You put your gear in first. Step one is put your gear in, figure out how it fits in there without the TechPack dividers, measure where the dividers go, measure twice, cut once, same as in construction. And what they've got here are these little pull tabs that you slip over these pins that go, they've got a, already a perimeter in the case of tech pack padded divider. And then the, the pieces can just, I'll show you how this works. There are these little, whoops, I didn't realize that was open. There are these little staple like pieces that slip in here. And if you put these little pull tabs on them, it makes it so that you can easily lift them out. And there's a cutting blade, reminds me of, as a backcountry skier of ski skin cutting blades, but you can slip this into here and it will easily cut through the foam material. You just gotta measure and make those cuts. So first step is gonna be laying out gear. So I'll, I'll sit back and figure out how that all is gonna work into this case. That, and I'll tell you really quick about the gear I wanna take with me to Joshua Tree. I have sort of my, my absolute mandatory stuff that's gotta go with me. That's the Z6, the Z7, 
the 24 to 70, the 14 to 30, um, and the, the 70 to 200, uh, 28 FLED. It's one of my favorite lenses ever, along with the, the 1.7 teleconverter, which works on that and turns it into a 340. Um, and I like to take my 50 millimeter 1.8, the, the Z lens. It's a fabulous, fabulous lens. I don't like to travel without my 20 millimeter 1.8. And I'd really like to bring along my uh, my 14 millimeter Rokinon 2.4 SP lens. This is a great star lens, along with you know some filters, battery charger, batteries, lens shades. So we'll see. And then I'd like to also you know I'm thinking about the fact that if I design this for the 70 to 200, I should be able to drop the 500 in there in a pinch because they're just about the same size. This is that 500. Um, the 500 e, the uh, the 5.6 pf um, and you know if there was a way to think about setting it up so that I could switch out lenses that would fit my 105 1.4 and my 300 pf um, f4 lens that would be great too those are all sort of off to the side to consider separately all right so I'm going to delve in. I'm going to sort of figure out how all this fits together, and it's going to take a little tinkering and trial and error, I think. All right. Ooh, that fits perfect right there. Let's put it up towards the, shove it in snug like that. That's nice. All right, so there. Uh, these two might go like, that. All right, well, I feel like I got that laid out a lot simpler than I might have expected. And I think, you know, I can, I can figure out how to put other things into the sides, like batteries, battery charger. The critical thing is having room for all of these lenses in here. Oh, there's one. But this one could trade out with that, with the divider, really easily. Perfect. Wow, this is super cool. I think this will leave room for, for a compartment that I can either separate or not separate, depending on what I want to do. Okay, cool. So I think the next thing I probably should do is cut these guys and put them in. So we'll just measure and start doing some cutting. All right, so I got it laid out, and I have a place where I could literally carry both my 70 to 200 and my 500, or I can do one or the other just by dropping one in, dropping one out. Pretty darn cool. I'm pretty stoked about it. So, whoops. Well, there are some little edges in there that I want to be a little bit aware of, though. I'll probably pad that a touch and put this in like that. Oh, there you go. That does it right there. If I put a little something soft under it, it's where the wheels are on the bottom. Same thing goes for here where the handle is. So I have to be a little bit cautious with that, but nothing that a little bit of padding can't take care of. Um, so, and there's a bunch of empty space in here actually that I can take and drop lens hoods or batteries or chargers into. I think it's going to be no problem at all to get everything that I want in there. So now the next step is to lock these pieces in place. It was actually a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Um, and now I need to take these little poles, these little, they're like zipper poles essentially, and just slip them around each of these little U pieces that I'm going to use so that it's really easy to take these back off. So again, like I said, this whole case has a perimeter of these of this tech pack stuff and by just pushing that in there it locks the piece I just set there in whoops I think I want to come one back over that nice and snug right right there that one two never having done this before 
I guess you skip one, but easy to pull that back out if I want to later. Um, and then I'll do the same thing with another. So I'll just run through putting all these little pieces on and dropping them in. Might need reading glasses for this one. It's fine work. All right, so I'm, I'm super impressed. That was way easier than I thought it was gonna be. And I got a lot more in it than I thought I was going to at first blush. And it's all secure enough in there that I'm pretty confident tilting it up and letting you have a look at it. So I got my 70 to 200 in a slot that will fit either it or the 500 PF. I've got my Z6, my Z7, my 51.8, my, uh, which one? Oh, and on the Z6 and Z7 are the 24 to 70 and 14 to 30. I got my 20 millimeter 1.8 Sunstar machine, the F mount lens that I love. I got my filters and a charger. Underneath each camera is a nest of four spare Nikon batteries for those, along with their eye cups are underneath them to kind of support them in there. I've got all my hoods, my uh, 1.8. 7 or my 1.4 teleconverter and a separate FTZ adapter. There's one already on my 70 to 200 and my 14 2.4 SP Rokinon star lens. Everything's in there. Everything's nice and secure. When I close it, I feel really confident. If I had to gate check it, I'd just drop a TSA lock on there and hand it to the stewardess. Pretty, pretty cool. So I promised I'd talk just a second about the difference between filming with the Nikon D850 I'm filming with right now and what I'm used to with one of these Z cameras. It's just night and day. First of all, the 850's image is just not quite as good in 4K. It seems like the processing technology going into the Z cameras is easier. It's easy, so easy to focus with the Z cameras. I trust their face detect autofocus and AFF for doing this kind of thing. With the Nikon, I still, I'm gonna go manual, make sure that I'm focused in on a point pretty close to myself, have enough aperture to make sure that I'm sharp enough for all you folks that are watching me. Uh, the, the D850 also splits up these longer clips into a whole bunch of smaller sub clips for some reason. If I hit record for some reason, I get like six, seven, eight clips instead of just one 29 minute long clip like I do with the Z6 or the Z7. It's also, you know, true that to get focus, I, I can't adjust the diopter for my eye and look through the viewfinder and see what I'm filming. I have to go to the uh, live view on the back of the camera, zoom in, get, break out my reading glasses, do all my adjustments. Everything's easier and the quality output is better with the Z cameras for filming. If you're working, doing much kind of hybrid shooting, filming, and you're still working with one of the digital SLRs, you really owe it to yourself to try a Z camera. Okay, and I've had a, a bunch of questions about, you know, I talked about doing autofocus the, the newer way with the Nikon Z cameras, using the auto area autofocus and AFC to capture live fast moving action. Don't even select a point to track. Just if you're moving and tracking a subject that's moving at the same rate, the camera picks it up. Yes, I had some questions about whether you have to hold down that back button focus button to activate it and have that working. Yes, you do. You have to, you have to as you see your subject, hit that button and track it. And as long as your finger's on that back button focus, it's going to track. Uh, and a lot of people said, you know, I like, I, I like having my focus on the shutter. I'm used to that. That's what I've always used. Why do you recommend going to back, back button focus? And I'll just say that with the exception of, you know, some professionals who really focus on shooting birds in flight and the same reason we just talked about, they don't want to have to hit that back button to track. Uh, Almost every professional I know uses back button focus. And the reason for that is really simple. If you're shooting a stationary subject, if you're shooting something that's not moving fast, whether it's a landscape, whether it's a still life, whether it's a portrait, you know, if you, if you get the autofocus with your back button and nail it, then when you take your thumb off the button, the shutter has nothing to do with autofocus. It isn't gonna mess up your, your focus to shift around and hit the shutter whenever you want to take a shot. It, it's an independent control. You know, now all of a sudden you focus with your thumb, you shoot with your finger. They're two separate functions. To me, 
it's always been frustratingly complicated to tie those things together to one button. You know, if, if I want to recompose, I don't want to have to shift my focus point to keep it from auto-focusing on nothing when the, the you know, when I'm reframed. I want to control that. I want to be able to just shift over, put the autofocus point on my subject, focus it, take my thumb off the focus, recompose however I want. As long as I don't move and my subject doesn't move, it's going to stay in focus and I can just shoot all I want. I need, I can move that focus point if I want. There's reasons to do that. But to work really quickly with a stationary subject, there's nothing better than back button focus. That's my opinion. I think you should try it. I think you should get used to it and you know, give it, a, give it a shot. It's something a little bit different. Again, if you want to flip it back to the shutter for tracking fast moving action and you don't want to have to hold the back button, I'll tell you that with a short amount of time, it becomes so second nature to just Use your thumb on the back button, shutter to fire. It's, it's, it, it doesn't take long for that muscle memory to set in. All right, everybody. So I am off this week to Joshua Tree. While you watch this video, I'll actually be there. I'm scouting for a workshop uh, with my good buddy Rick LePage. We'll be running one next winter, sort of the same time of year, 2021. Uh, we've done Death Valley a lot. Thought it'd be kind of fun to go down to Joshua Tree. Rick knows and loves Joshua Tree, so he's going to show me around. We're going to plan out a workshop for next year. Um, and on that point, I said I'd talk a little bit about Cuba. Rick and I are running a workshop in Cuba right after I run a workshop with, with my good buddy David Archer in Kauai in February. We still have a couple slots left in that Kauai workshop. Uh, it's just a couple of slots. The house is completely sold out. We're staying in a big house in Princeville and we're going to mainly focus on the north shore of Kauai. We're going to do helicopter flights. I'll put a link to that in there if you want to jump in at the last minute. That's the end of the month. It would have to be soon because I need to book those seats in the open door helicopter fast. Uh, but it's going to be a lot of fun. And then it's off to uh, to Cuba with my buddy Rick, and we have some slots in the in the the workshop that's in early April, sort of end of March, early April. The second workshop because we sold out the first one so quickly, we opened a second one. That second one's more than half full. There's only a few slots remaining, uh, and I've had someone jump across from the first to the second to bring their wife along because there wasn't room for another. Uh, so there's one slot remaining in the one at the end of March. So I'll put a link into those as well if you're interested. That's going to be a hell of a trip. It's all inclusive. We pick you up at the airport. We'll be staying in old mansions. There'll be a person there to do laundry and cook in the private residence we're staying. We're going on a supporting the Cuban people visa. We'll be meeting with local photographers and business owners and photographing old cars and, and music and dance and going out to the beautiful agricultural valley of Vignales and photographing the limestone cliffs, staying at this beautiful place that overlooks the cliffs at dawn. Uh, the people are wonderful, the music's great, the food is fantastic, and it's some of the best street photography and cultural photography you'll ever do. I think that going to Cuba right now uh, is a really, really fabulous place to go as a travel photographer because it's changing fast. A lot of different countries are sending tourism there. Uh, and right now it's still very authentic and very, very cool. So, all right, everybody, thanks so much for watching, and we'll, I'll see you next week after uh, I get back from Joshua Tree.